Please welcome to the stage John J. DeJoya, President of Georgetown University, and President Bill Clinton, founder Clinton Foundation and 42nd President of the United States. Good morning. It's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you here today for the inaugural lecture in a new series, The Clinton Lectures at Georgetown. This marks the beginning of a journey we will take together over the course of the coming years to learn from one of the most accomplished global leaders of our time and someone we are proud to call a son of Georgetown. President Clinton, it is an honor to welcome you back to the Hilltop, and we're deeply grateful for your sustained commitment to Georgetown, for all you've contributed to our community throughout the decades, and of course, for the extraordinary impact that you have had throughout our nation and our world. I wish to welcome our colleagues here from the Clinton Foundation and the Clinton Global Initiative, and I wish to welcome everyone watching on our webcast, especially our friends at the University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service. After President Clinton delivers his lecture, he will take questions from both our students here at Georgetown as well as students from the Clinton School. Clara Gustafson, a senior in our School of Foreign Service and our past president of the Georgetown University Student Association, will join the president on stage to ask him your questions. This is an historic day on our campus. We celebrate the inaugural lecture in a series that we believe will have a deep and meaningful impact, not just within our university community, but throughout the academy and the world of policy, politics, and global affairs. We're privileged here to call one of the greatest public servants and political practitioners of our time a member of the Georgetown family. From his days as an international affairs major in the School of Foreign Service, through his years as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford and a law student at Yale, to his tenure as governor of Arkansas, to his eight years in the White House, and his extraordinary post-presidency and work through the Clinton Global Initiative, President Clinton has demonstrated an unmatched political mind, an ability to bring people together, to forge real tangible change, and to discern with extraordinary clarity lasting solutions to our most pressing needs. For example, during his presidency, he helped to reform the welfare system, strengthen environmental regulations, and turn a massive federal budget deficit into a surplus. He also helped to expand international trade, intervene to end ethnic cleansing in Bosnia, and to promote a framework for peace in Northern Ireland. In more recent years, through the innovative model of the Clinton Global Initiative, he has brought together more than 150 heads of state 20 Nobel Prize laureates, and hundreds of leaders from multiple sectors to address some of our world's greatest challenges. To, to date, the Clinton Global Initiative members have made more than 2,300 commitments which have improved the lives of more than 400 million people in more than 180 countries. President Clinton represents the very best of our tradition at Georgetown, a tradition that is guided by our Catholic and Jesuit identity and that calls us to seek a deeper understanding of ourselves and our world and to use that knowledge for the betterment of humankind. One of the great forums for this work is a lecture series such as this one. In these forums, we look to eminent leaders and thinkers to distill their experiences and to share with us their insights lessons learned, and vision for the future. President Clinton himself offered such a series of lectures here once before, in 1991, as then governor of Arkansas, 
And as a candidate for president, he presented three New Covenant speeches to students in Gaston Hall on responsibility in rebuilding the American community, on economic change, and on American security. And he's also returned here many more times throughout his presidency and post-presidency, speaking to our community about such topics as the responsibility of citizenship and the Clinton-Gore economics of the 1990s. Through the series we launch today, President Clinton will continue the conversation he's had with us throughout the decades, and will also continue the tradition of so many iconic members of our community who have shared the wisdom of their careers and their lives through defining courses and lectures. President Clinton has recalled such icons from his time as a student here, Carol Quigley and his lectures on public authority, Father Joseph Seabees and his classes on world cultures, and Ulrich Allers on the history of political thought. In fact, it was Carol Quigley who coined the concept future preference, the act of sacrificing the present for the future. President Clinton called upon this idea in his acceptance speech for the Democratic nomination, and it's an idea that would serve as a guiding theme throughout his career. In 1993, he addressed members of the Diplomatic Corps from the steps of Old North, explaining that Professor Quigley taught him, quote, that the future can be better than the present and that each of us has a personal moral responsibility to make it so. President Clinton has lived these words throughout his career, and he joins us today coming full circle from his days as a student to begin a series that continues this tradition of great lectures within our community. We're deeply honored by his presence here today and by his continued commitment to Georgetown, to our nation, and to our global family. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce to you President Bill Clinton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, President DeJoya. Thank you for the walk down memory lane that you uh, gave me. I, I want to thank in advance Claire Augustuson for presenting your questions. Uh, I told her she could ask whatever she wanted. I often say the great thing about being a former president is you can say whatever you please. <laughs> and the uh, sad thing is nobody has to care anymore. <laughs> I want to thank my friends who are here, my Georgetown classmates, the members of my administration, people I have known for many years, sometimes in both categories. I am delighted to be back here. The speeches I gave at Georgetown in late 1991, setting the stage for my presidential campaign and also for actually what I would do if I got elected, were very important not only to shape the campaign, but for me, they forced all of us who were trying to win that election to think about where we were, where we wanted to go, how we proposed to get there. I thought it might be helpful to the students here, and this talk is mainly directed to you. I understand some of you showed up at 4.30 to make sure you got a seat. And uh, I hope you didn't also get pneumonia, but I, <laughs> I'm honored that you took the trouble to come. You can see that I have prepared this. No one has written this for me. This is, I have thought a lot about this. And what I would like to do is to talk about organizing a life for service in the public good whether as an elected official, a career public servant, or someone in private life 
who wants to do public good as a private citizen. I have given a lot of thought to this, and I've had a lot of time to do it. In just a few days, I'll be coming back to Georgetown for my 45th reunion. Those 45 years pass quickly. I am grateful that a whole set of chance circumstances brought me here today. I only applied to one college when I was in high school. I knew I wanted to come here. And I wasn't accepted until June. <laughs> that's not the June, that's the June before the... <laughs> and uh, I think when I showed up, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the first Jesuit I met said, what is a Southern Baptist from Arkansas with no foreign language except Latin doing in the School of Foreign Service? And I said, Father, we'll just have to figure it out as we go along. <laughs> I knew why I wanted to come here. When I was 16, and I'll say more about this later, I literally made a decision that although I, there was no basis based on my family or circumstances to think I'd succeed, that I wanted to go into politics if I could. And the typical route to that when I was a young man was to go to the state university, you know, make all the friends you could, and then look for your chance. I, I thought it was more important to be well prepared. And I felt the world was getting smaller and that I needed to understand things that I could never learn if I never left the borders of my state. I had come to Washington in the summer of 1963 with the American Legion program, Boys Nation, and I wanted to come back. And the School of Foreign Service had the reputation of being the best and also most cosmopolitan undergraduate program in the city. And so I just applied. And I waited and waited and waited. <laughs> and they let me in. I. Uh, I'm very glad they did, and I'm glad I came. After I left Georgetown, I spent five more years sort of preparing to live my life. I went to Oxford, as President DeJoy said, and then I came back to law school at Yale, and that's where I met Hillary. And then I went home and briefly taught in the Arkansas Law School and started my political career. And with the interruption of two losses in campaigns, I was involved in politics for 27 years. And then after I left, I set up the Clinton Foundation, and I've done that since. And that was interesting to me because Hillary was the person in our family who was always involved in foundation activities. In doing public good as a private citizen. Uh, working in the legal clinic when we were at Yale, setting up the first legal clinic we ever had in the northwest part of our state when we came home to Arkansas, organizing a group called the Arkansas Advocates for Families and Children, which still is doing well today. In our state, which was when we came home, 49th in per capita income, taking the children's hospital to one of the 10 biggest children's hospitals in the country. She lived this stuff, and she was on all kinds of other boards. And, and when I was president, she got me to start meeting with civil society leaders as I traveled to countries around the world, not just to meet with the leaders and the leaders of the political opposition, but the, the non-governmental organization leaders. I did it in India and in Turkey and various African countries and in Latin America. This was really her life, and it was one I had never imagined living. And I'll never forget, sometime in the first year after I left the White House, I got up in the morning and I was shaving, and I looked in the mirror and I said, my God, I have become an NGO. 
So anyway, <laughs> I say that because I've had the opportunity to see from the grassroots up how politics works through dramatic changes in our country's life. The year I graduated from Georgetown, 1968, was probably the most tumultuous year since the end of World War II, except for 2001 and 9-11, perhaps even more than the tumult that occurred in the aftermath of the financial crisis. Then I've had the opportunity to start and attempt to build a non-governmental organization with a very specific focus that works in more than 100 countries around the world. So this whole thing has very, been extremely interesting to me. And especially these last 12 years, I, I've really had a good time. People always ask me, don't you miss being president? And I tell the truth, once in a while I do. Once in a while when there's some problem that I think I know a lot about or some dilemma that I feel particularly well suited to solve, I think, you know, I'd kind of like to do that. But I think it is foolish, and I hope all of you will remember this, it is foolish to spend one day of your life wishing you could do anything you can no longer do. Our days are limited. Like I said, these 45 years pass quickly. So it's always best to focus on what's at hand and what you can do, and to imagine and sometimes reimagine the tasks that you're involved with. And I've, I've really had a great time doing this, but I realize I am part of something much bigger. One of the great good news stories of the turn of the century and the early 21st century is the explosion of the non-governmental movement. The United States has about a million foundations of various sizes, down to community foundations, up to the Gates Foundation, which is not only the wealthiest, but arguably the best. They, are, they do wonderful work. And that doesn't count the 355,000 religious institutions all across our country of all different faiths that try to do public good as a part of their mission. Half of those foundations have been established since 1995. And you see it in India, half a million active NGOs based in India. And there are a lot more registered that may or may not be activated, I think, depending on the financial means of the people who registered them. China has about a quarter of a million registered and probably at least that many more not registered for fear of political reprisals of one kind or another. Russia used to have 150,000, but Mr. Putin seems to think they're a threat. <laughs> and in some ways they are, ways that by and large are quite pop positive. Um, I remember thinking about the freedom component of the NGO movement, when <laughs> there was a hilarious cartoon that appeared in many newspapers in America at the end of my middle of my second term, when I was in a long-running battle with the Republican special counsel, Kenneth Starr. So in this cartoon, I'm talking to the president of China, Zhang Zemin. And I said, you know, you ought to allow more political liberty. And in our country, these people you keep putting in jail, they'd be out there speaking on the street corner. He said, yeah, and in our country, Kenneth Starr would be in jail making tennis shoes. <laughs> <laughs> that was the cartoon. So it was really funny. The, uh, <laughs> made me reconsider my whole position on liberty. But anyway. <laughs> No, but the point I'm trying to make is this NGO movement has also been a thorn in the side of governments, and they're like anybody else, they're not always right, but they basically have pushed the envelope of liberty and political responsiveness in a way that I think is very positive. 
So now, having had the benefit of about 40 years of experience in politics and in NGOs, I have reached a, a firm conclusion that 21st century citizenship requires every thoughtful person to try to do some public good, even if they're in private life. When we all came here almost half century ago now, the definition of good citizenship was pretty much something like this. You should stay in school as long as you can and do as well as you can, and when you get out, you need to go to work. If you have a student loan, you should repay it. You should try to do a good job at whatever your work is, and if you start a family, you should try to do a good job with that because raising children is society's most important work. You should pay your taxes and otherwise obey the law and be informed enough to cast an intelligent vote at election time. Now, even then, there were lots of people involved in public service as private citizens. There was the local, United Way, there are people volunteering in their schools, there was wealthy people would give money to arts institutions and things like that, but nothing like today. And it was viewed as a nice thing, but not the imperative of every citizen. Today, with the explosion of internet giving, of cell phone giving through text, the tsunami was the first great national, international disaster where the United States gave a billion dollars and the median contribution was $56 because half the people gave over the internet. In Haiti, after the earthquake, the American people gave a billion dollars. The median contribution was $26 because so many people texted Haiti, and then a number for the Red Cross or the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund or any number of other things. The, the empowerment of technology has him also imposed more possibilities and more responsibilities. So I have reached the conclusion that whatever your politics and whatever you do with your life, 21st century citizenship requires us to add to that litany that I brought with me in my head to Georgetown some way of doing public good as a private citizen around the corner or around the world, in office or out. And so what I wanted to do with this series of talks, of which I think there will be four, is to talk about how to compose and live a life where service is important. I think that it is so important because the world is so interdependent. It is so full of opportunities. You see the other day that two more planets sighted in a constellation far outside our solar system appear to be far enough away from their sun and dense enough to support life. I'd love to be your age just to figure out if I could live long enough to find out if we're in the universe alone. I almost give up being president and take my chances on winning again just to find out. <laughs> we have constant new discoveries in particle physics thanks to the superconducting supercollider at CERN in Switzerland which should have been in Texas, but I lost it as part of the economic agreement that brought the economy back in 1993. <laughs> the Unum genome discoveries and applications are already stunning. I was at St. Jude's Hospital in Memphis, the biggest children's cancer center in the country, where they open source all their developments as soon as they have them. They send them to every cancer hospital in the world on every continent. And they had just discovered, because of their ability to do genomic testing, 
the answer to a terrible riddle. There was a relatively rare but extremely dangerous form of childhood brain cancer for which there was a, a drug already approved by the FDA, which was 100% effective, 100% cure rate, except when it wasn't, and then it seemed to be causing the death of all the other kids, about 25% of the people who had this condition. And because they were able to do genomic testing, they found that in the cluster of kids that were not responding positively to the medicine, there was a different set of genomes. And then, almost as an act of God, they just decided to give the minority group that were all perishing, kids that came in that had that profile, half a dose of the approved medicine, they all got well. Then they said, well, maybe we were giving everybody too much. So then they gave the half a dose to the majority group, and it didn't help any of them. They had to have the whole dose. The point is, this apparently simple solution was made possible by the exploration of the billions of genomes in the human body. I spent $5 billion of your money to sequence the human genome. It now costs them $5,000 a person to do the tests. It will soon be down to 3,500, and the hospital told me they expected it to be at 1,000 or less within five years. So it's an exciting time to be alive. But we all know the world is full of many challenges. It is, there's too much inequality and instability. It's a terrible constraint on growth and opportunity and investment. And there aren't enough jobs being created, not even for college graduates across the world. One of the reasons for the demonstrations of young people in Tahrir Square is that the Egyptian higher education system was producing 400,000 college graduates a year and nowhere near 400,000 jobs for college graduates. Mexico, under the recently departed President Calderon, set up 140 tuition-free public universities, which last year produced in a country whose population is about a little more than 30 percent of ours, 113,000 engineers. Stunning achievement. But will there be enough jobs for them? And will there be enough investment so that the poor will also find their path out of poverty? We have to do something about this. There's too much inequality and too much instability. But look what happened with the financial crisis. You want some instability. You want the possibility of failure. Otherwise, the successes in the free market won't be rewarded properly and invested in. But if there's too much instability and too much inequality, the whole thing shuts down. The world we're living in is clearly unsustainable. We have serious Atlantic warming, serious melting this year. There was a 90 percent of the area of Greenland, which has 8 percent of the world's fresh water. 90 percent of it melted last summer, had some melt. Typically, for more than 100 years since they've been measuring, the maximum is 50 percent. The oceans are becoming more acidic because they're trying to absorb more carbon to help us stay in balance, and it's interrupting a lot of the fishing stocks of the world, and fish provide protein, the main source of protein, for more than a billion people. So for the last two or three years, it's the first time in history that more fish have been grown on fish farming operations than caught naturally in the oceans, the lakes, the streams, the rivers of the world. And there is, as yet, no international conference saying what they can and cannot be fed, as a result of which we are going to have bad consequences, the details of which we don't yet know. So the way we consume and produ produce and consume energy and other local resources have put us on an unsustainable path to the future. I don't know how many of you saw the New York Times article in the last two weeks about how many Chinese 
parents are desperate to find a way to leave China because their children are all getting asthma and they're sick. And how, how many who have the money to do so put their children in schools where the athletic fields are covered with tents, these great balloon-like tents with serious air filters in them so the children can get what passes for outdoor exercise. And I could give you lots of other examples. But the point is, the world is awash in too much inequality and instability and unsustainability. And finally, in this modern world where we can look at planets 120 million light years away and think that might be my great-great-grandchild's home, where we can imagine further advances in the human genome and nanotechnology that I also spent a lot of your money on, <laughs> allowing all of us to have four physicals a year by just stepping into canisters that will measure us up and down and find all the malignancies before they can possibly be big enough to kill us. I'll make you a prediction. Within 15 years, one of the great debates in medical practice will be when to zap out tumors, because all of us have cancerous cells in our bodies all the time, and our bodies just dispose of most of them. So it's an amazing time. But what is really tearing the world up are the oldest divisions, the religious divisions, the political divisions. Yesterday, we read that there might be a new civil war in Iraq because finally the Sunnis, having rejected the extremism of al-Qaeda in Iraq, are now organizing around the old Ba'athist uh, ideology and people who are there, and they don't think the Shia majority have been fair to them. We just read today, this morning, when I got up, uh, the story of the Nigerian military virtually wiping out a village in northern Nigeria in their ongoing war against Boko Haram, the militant Muslim organization which feels that its people have not been fairly treated in the confederation, which is Nigeria, and on and on and on. You know all this. But it is very interesting that in spite of all this globalization, in spite of our being thrown together, in spite of the opportunities that I see, in spite of the diversity I see in this crowd, we still see the world put at risk when things don't work out so well in America for two young brothers from Chechnya who were given a chance to get an education and come here and it Apparently, it didn't work out so well. And so you had the Boston Marathon incident. And the young man who tried to blow up the car bomb in Times Square a couple of years ago, he and his wife both got university degrees in this country and were made to feel welcome. And for a while, he had a good job and a, and a home and a mortgage, like all the rest of us do when we start out. And then it didn't work out. And he decided an appropriate response was to go back to Pakistan, learn how to make a bomb, and take it to Times Square. One of the things we learned in the genome is that the study is that all people are 99.5% the same. Even the gender differences are rooted in just half a percent of our genome. We got people in this room today from all over the world. And if you just look around, every difference you can see between somebody else and yourself is rooted in one half of 1% of your genomic makeup. And yet, every one of us, even those of us who are fairly apolitical, spent 99.5% of our time worrying about that half a percent of us. It's different. Now, we can all laugh about it. I wish I were taller or thinner or faster. If I'd had a four-foot vertical jump, I might have had a different life. But the differences do matter. That tiny bit of difference gave Albert Einstein a brain bigger than 
most people imagine could be carried safely inside a human skull. And he put it to pretty good use. And I could give you lots of other examples. I can say that I was 99.5% the same as Mohandas Gandhi, but he had a pretty remarkable life with whatever was in that little half percent that was different. On the other hand, most of the truly great people who have ever lived taught us how to connect the little bit of us that is different with the big part of us we have in common. So you are going to live in a world where you had to figure out how to reconcile all these challenges with all the opportunities. And I believe you will have no choice but to do public service, whether you're in private life or not. And I think that it will make a big difference for two reasons. One, there's always a gap between what the private sector can produce and the government can provide that you need non-governmental groups to try to fill. Two, in the poorest countries, systems have to be built. In the richest countries, systems have ossified and have to be reformed. And very often, it can't be done entirely from within. So the new 21st century mission for non-governmental organizations, the whole reason for being of our foundation is to figure out how to work with government and with the private sector to do things faster, cheaper, better, to break through the limits that the current arrangements impose on people all over the world. But to do any of that as well as possible, it is necessary to think about what you're doing and to have some idea. It seems to me that if you want to take service seriously, whether you want to be a political candidate or just a person who does right, there are four requirements you should be obsessively interested in people, especially people who are different from you. You should want to understand them. You should want to understand how they perceive the world and how they perceive what they need and what their dreams are. Two, you should care about principles about the end of all this. What is the purpose of service? What's the role of government? What's the role of NGOs? How do you organize this in your mind? Why are you doing this? Three, what are the policies that you believe will advance those purposes? And four, whether you're running for anything or not, what are the politics of the situation? How are you going to turn your good intentions into real changes? So I want to talk about people, purpose, policies, and politics. But to me, the most important thing is the first. Most people get in real trouble and abuse power when they forget that the purpose of their power is not to impose their will on others, but to let other people be empowered to live their own lives better, or as I always say, to have better stories. So I want to start with that. People ask me all the time, how in the world did you ever get elected president? <laughs> it's a mystery to me, too. Uh, no, how did you, only two governors of small states have ever been elected. And as I said, when I was born in Arkansas at the end of World War II, I think our per capita income was 56% of the national average. Only Mississippi was poor. No one in my direct family had ever been to college. My father was killed in a car wreck before I was born. My mother went back to nursing school. My grandparents raised me till I was four with a lot of help from my great uncle and his wife. And people talk about that like it was a disadvantage. 
It was actually probably the key to all my later success. You can't imagine life without a cell phone and a computer. I was born to into a family without a television, without even a private telephone line. We were on what were called party lines. You worried about all the snoops today? Your neighbors could just pick up the phone and listen to who you were chewing out. <laughs> and you had to wait till your neighbor got off the phone. So it was, by conventional standards, poor. And it was deeply segregated. But in both the black and white communities, families were more coherent up and down the economic spectrum than they are today. There were more two-parent households. There was less divorce. There, were, there was more character building, if you will, at home. I have employed at one time or another four members of the Kearney family, an African-American family from a tiny town of 1,000 in southeast Arkansas. There were 19 of them, 17 kids, a mom and a dad. The dad was a sharecropper. The mother was a domestic. 13 of the 17 kids got college degrees. The other four did real well. One of them joked that he made more than almost all of his college graduate siblings. All of them had a first name that started with a J. And one I made the chairman of the Public Service Commission in Arkansas. He graduated from Harvard and Harvard Law School. One was my diarist in the White House. One worked for me in the Attorney General's office, and another one I gave a big appointment to. I always said, as long as I got the Kearney family to vote for me, I couldn't lose any election. <laughs> they had a family reunion that included a stop in the White House when I was there, and 15 of the 17 kids were still alive. And so was the dad at 102. I say that because I could give you lots of other examples that people are not defined just by their per capita income. And there are incredibly powerful, dignified people who manage to compose a life out of their poverty, and from them we can learn how to help them and their children get out of poverty. And this is true all over the world. My uh, great-grandfather, whom I used to love to go and stay with, the longest living man in my family, he lived to be 76. Everybody since then, nobody's made it as long as I have. So I try to, I, I'd like to emulate my great-grandfather, but it seems impossible. He was never out of overalls and hobnail boots, and he lived in an old house out in the woods in the country that was a wooden house, unpainted, built up off the ground, and you had to have a storm cellar in Arkansas because it was the tornado capital of America then. It was a hole in the ground with a cot and an oil lantern, and I used to go down there very often accompanied by snakes that would slither in and out. He was a very, very good man, as was my great-grandmother, a good woman. I learned a lot from them things that are still valuable to me today. But most of the lessons I got from childhood, I got from my grandfather and my great uncle. My grandfather in the Great Depression, to give you an idea of how different then and now was, even though a lot of you may be worried about student loan debt and finding jobs and all this, in the Great Depression, 25% of Americans were out of work. And my grandfather worked on an ice truck Back then, refrigerators were called ice boxes, and they actually took ice blocks and put them in part of the refrigerator and kept the rest of the food uh, cold. And so my grandfather, who weighed about 150 pounds, carried 200-pound blocks of ice on his back. 
with thongs that he hooked onto the ice and put it on his back. So fast forward. This is why stories are important. 1976, I was running for attorney general of Arkansas, and I went back to this little town where I was born. And I went to see this guy who was a judge. And he was an elected judge, so he could be active in politics. He said, I have to be for you. Whether I wanted to or not, I'd have to be. I said, why? He said, because in the Depression, when I was 10 years old, your grandfather, who had no money himself, still hired boys like me to ride on that ice truck one a day with him, and he'd pay us a quarter. And we thought a quarter was all the money in the world. And he said, as a matter of fact, the first time I got paid and your granddad gave me a quarter, I asked him if I could instead have two dimes and a nickel so I would feel richer walking home. <laughs> and he said, walking home, I started shaking the coins in my pocket, and one of the dimes fell out into the grass by the sidewalk. And he said, I looked for that thing for an hour and a half until I had to go home. It got dark. I never found it. And he said, I never go by that spot that I still don't stop and look for that dime. <laughs> I say that because we take certain things for granted. That, and I say that because it's very important for you, if you want to do this work, to realize something I learned from my grandfather and from my uncle, which is that everybody has some kind of story like that. My uncle had a sixth grade education and 180 IQ, at least. He was the smartest man in my family. And um, he was a fireman and a farmer. And I used to go out even after everybody moved to towns in Arkansas after the Depression. People remember the Depression. So if they could afford it, they'd keep an acre of land out in the country and grow as much of their own food as they could. And I used to go out there when I was a kid and farm with him. And then we'd have these meals. And he was one of the funniest people I've ever seen, and his kids were funny. And I would sit there with them and laugh until I cried, just listen to him talk about ordinary people in our town, the guy that ran the grocery store or the drugstore, or somebody that worked at the factory that my aunt worked at. Why am I telling you this? Because people ask me all the time, where did you learn to speak? And I said, by, I learned to speak by learning to listen. In our family, nobody could afford a vacation. There was one movie theater in our town. It didn't change movies very often. My family had hunting, fishing, and dinner meals. And the meals were a feast because people just told stories. And when you were a kid like me, you couldn't tell a story unless you proved you could listen to one. So somebody tell a story, and then my uncle or my aunt would look at me and she said, did you understand that? I said, I think so. I said, what did you just hear? Once you did that two or three times, then if you had something to tell, you could tell it. But what I learned in this whole thing is that everybody has a story. And everybody's life has things about it that are inherently interesting and valuable to the rest of us, even though most people can't get it out because they're too self-conscious or shy or whatever. But the point is, in the beginning, I learned that you can't really speak unless you can first listen, not in a way that people can hear. And I see it today when I see a lot of these verbal spats going on here in Washington. Whenever you see it, wherever it's coming from, ask yourself, did this person say that thing to genuinely be heard by people who disagree with him or her? Or did this person say that thing in that way because they wanted to be on television? or because they wanted to reassure their own crowd that they were carrying the spear forward. In a free society, if you want democracy to work, 
people have to be able to hear each other. And whether someone can hear you depends in part on what you say, but maybe even more on how you say it and whether you have first listened to them. So I learned all these stories. When my great uncle was nearly 90, he could still remember the names of hunting dogs he had had in the 1930s. Who sold him the dogs? The way he bargained for them. How they ran in the springtime when the cold and the frost lifted. And to me, I could have been listening to Pavarotti sing because of the way he told the story. And he made his life have meaning and interest. So this per capita income was low. And I'm not trying to romanticize poverty. I'd like everybody who gets rid of it. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get you not to belittle people who know less than you do, have less than you do, or less credential than you are. There is a reason why the Jesuits have spent centuries now serving the poor. There is a reason why all the scriptures of all the different faiths acknowledge that what we have in common in our soul is important. And it helps me today when we try to help farmers in Rwanda and Malawi to have heard the stories of people who seem to be poor, but in fact were rich when I was young. Don't ever romanticize poverty. It is way overrated. But don't denigrate the people who live in it because there is a mountain of evidence that there is a lot of dignity there. And I saw those stories when I was young. When I was a little older, I, I moved to a town that was the polar opposite of the one I was born in. Hot Springs was a national park, the first land set aside under Andrew Jackson as a national reserve before there were any natural parks. Thomas Jefferson sent a friend of his there to look at these hot sulfur springs to see what their properties were because they had people bathing in them since the 16th century when Hernando de Soto came there and thought he had discovered the fountain of youth. When World War II ended and Eastern Europe was being taken over, a large number of people left and found their way to my little hometown. So there I was in the middle of Arkansas with a doctor running a restaurant who was from Czechoslovakia with a vibrant Greek Orthodox community with two synagogues with Muslims coming from Syria and elsewhere. They're all in my little hometown. So I saw a little microcosm of the world even though I was living in the segregated South with all of its problems. I was, at the time, still trying to figure out what was going on, and I was, we'd had a television since I was 10, but I still learned more from the stories of the kids I went to school with, the people I saw on the street, and my teachers. And I would just like to just give you a flavor of what it was like. I had a science teacher, and I've told this story many times, but it's the most important thing I can tell you. I had a science teacher in the eighth grade who was a retired coach, and to put it charitably, he was not a handsome man. <laughs> he was overweight, and his clothes were too tight, and he had Coke bottles with thick glasses, and he smoked cheap cigars out of it with a, a plastic cigar holder, which squenched his mouth up. And he had a beautiful wife who was a history teacher. And she had a beautiful sister who was my geometry teacher. So the family was there. And they were terrific people. But the old science teacher said, 
near the end of our course when I was, I was 13. This is 53 years ago. I remember this like it was yesterday. He said, kids, you're not going to remember anything I taught you in science. So if you don't remember anything else, you just remember this. Every morning I get up and I go into the bathroom, put shaving cream on my face, shave, wash the shaving cream off, I look into the mirror and I say, Vernon, you're beautiful. <laughs> he said, you got to remember that. Everybody wants to believe they're beautiful. Everybody. And he said, if you remember that, it'll keep you out of trouble and bring a lot of possibilities to your life. 53 years later, that is what I remember about my science class. In my hometown, all those years ago, 50 years ago, I met the first person I knew who was gay. He was a teacher. It was unthinkable 50 years ago that he would come out. But all of his students knew, and we loved him. And there was a sort of practiced hypocrisy, at least in my hometown, about it, that as long as you didn't say, you would be accepted. It was an interesting thing. And it started half a century of thinking about identity in a way I had never thought about it before. When I came to Georgetown, I was most influenced by the fact that for the first time in my life, I had, was around students from everywhere, including places in America I'd never been, like New York. My roommate at Georgetown, I, I thought, oh, I'm going to liberal Georgetown, I'm going to escape Arkansas, which was about to, I was afraid, vote for Barry Goldwater over Lyndon Johnson. And I get to my room in Loyola Hall, 225 Loyola, and there's a Goldwater for President bumper sticker on my door. <laughs> Everybody thought I would be a Southern, you know, redneck, I was for Johnson. I thought, oh my God, I came all the way up here for this. <laughs> and my roommate was an Irish Catholic guy from Long Island whose father was a member of the Conservative Party and an elected judge. He actually thought Goldwater was a little too liberal. <laughs> Fast forward, I lived with that guy for four years. I still talk to him all the time. I'll see him at the reunion. He's as good a person as I ever met in my life. And one day, his politics came to conform with his private life. Through a set of family misfortunes, his wife's sister had a child with cerebral palsy that she couldn't raise. My friend and his wife took her in and raised her as their own. She's built a successful and pretty independent life. When he was a pilot living in Orange County, California, their idea of a vacation was to go to Mexico and help poor people build their houses. He called me one day when I was having my fight with the pre-Tea Party Tea Party when I, in 95, and I was trying to decide to veto their budget. And everybody said, oh, if you do this, they'll kill you. They just won the Congress. You'll be a one-termer. One night, this man, a book I might have judged by his cover, called me and he said, let me get this straight. He said, I'm an airline pilot with a good living. The budget the Congress proposes wants to give me a tax cut in return for which they would cut spending on programs that help disabled kids like my daughter. I said, yeah, that's it. He said, for example, he said, my daughter's best friend who also has cerebral palsy, we go to school together. Her mother is a minimum wage worker who travels one hour a day to work and one hour a day home on public transportation. Now, as I understand this bill, it's gonna cut the transportation subsidies so her bus ride will be more expensive. It's gonna cut subsidies for her child's wheelchair and shoes, and by the way, then, at least, children with cerebral palsy regularly had to get about six pairs of quite expensive shoes every year. 
They're going to take all that away to give me a tax cut? I said, that's right. That's what's going to happen. He said, Bill, that's immoral. You can't let it happen. You've got to veto that budget. My friend's Catholic values overcame his political upbringing. His story overwhelmed the circumstances under which he lived. I did, and when I got elected president, I may have been the only Democrat he ever voted for, but <laughs> it, it was no longer the case. He saw a live child he had taken to raise who had a friend who was just like his daughter, except she had no money. And he knew what would really happen. So it wasn't a theoretical discussion. The story pierced his heart and changed his mind. When I went, I could give you lots of other stories. Father Hanser just celebrated, celebrated his 75th birthday. He actually took me to a Howard Johnson's for a hamburger when I was a freshman and asked me if I ever thought about becoming a Jesuit. <laughs> and I asked him if I had to become a Catholic first. <laughs> and he said, what do you mean? I said, I'm a Southern Baptist. I'm not eligible. <laughs> he said, I've read your test papers. It's, it's not possible you think like a Catholic. So we agreed it was only because of his overpowering skills as a professor that he had reworked my mind. But nonetheless, I was who I was, and I didn't become a priest. And I think life worked out pretty well for both of us. <laughs> but I love the Jesuits for reasons that I don't know would even be popular today. There were two Hungarian professors who'd gone to the fourth grade together in a little town in Hungary. One taught international economics. One, Father Sebes, later became the dean of the School of Foreign Service. And he taught world religions, a class of 200 students, for all non-Catholics took it. It was affectionately called Buddhism for Baptists. <laughs> At the end of the course, Father Sebes gave an oral exam in 12 languages. He said, if you don't feel comfortable writing this exam, I'll give you an oral. And he started reeling off the languages he would give an oral in. And I thought, you know, I would like to be educated in a tradition that used that much of my brain. Father Zarini taught economics. He taught five classes of sophomore economics with 40 people each, as I remember. And you had to sit in an assigned seat, and you had to, attendance was mandatory until Thanksgiving. After which, you never had to come back. And if you did, you could sit wherever you want. I am not making this story up. <laughs> Five to, so flash forward, we're at the end of the second semester, and I am walking down a hall with one of my classmates named Neil Grimaldi, who later headed overseas people in my, for my campaign. So Grimaldi had Zarini, he said, Father, I, yeah, I, I wish I could, can I come see you? I'm worried about the exam. And Zarini looked at him and said, well, what do you expect? You've missed three classes. He had, from the beginning of school through Thanksgiving, memorized every student and developed a system which would enable him to tell him which of the 200 were there and where they had been. I couldn't believe it. And for a long time, I thought it was some sort of magic trick. <laughs> so 10 years later, when I was governor, I came back to see Father Gerini. And I was in his office. He, I just ran into him. So he said, come up and have a talk. So I'm in his office. And this woman called him, who was a year older than me, and asked him for a job reference. And he said, what's the job? And he told her, he said, yeah, send me the information. I'll write you a job reference. And he hangs up the phone. He said, do you remember her? I said, yes, I didn't know her well, but I do. He said, you know, she made a B the first semester and a B plus the second semester. 
no computers. So he's got this card catalog stack with um, this card deck, and he, he goes down to her class and pulls out her card and shows it to me, and she made a B and a B plus. I wanted to be able to think one-tenth that well. There was a big movement at the end of my time at Georgetown to liberalize the curriculum, which I think has been done. You need to know, all my classmates and I were here, we did not have a single elective until the second semester of our junior year. No electives. And because of the influence of these professors, I was opposed to changing it, which made me about as popular, you know, as the, you name it, with my fellow classmates. <laughs> but I became a lifetime friend of Father Seabees, and after he left Georgetown, he went to the Vatican and lived in a little room and did his own research. And when he died, I got a lovely letter from the young priest who found him, who said he kept a, a roll of letters from his former students. And mine were my, the letters I wrote to him when I was governor were in there. And he sent them to me, and, copies of them. And he sent me an account of his last days and the last picture taken of him in the Vatican. I still have it in my files. Why am I telling you this? Because when these boys, CBs and Zarini, grew up and became, went into the order, their lives took different turns. CBs went to Asia because he spoke all these Asian languages. And the communist Chinese didn't like it that he was doing his missionary work. And they put him in a four by four foot hole and he lost a lot of his stomach. So when he came out, Needless to say, he was pretty anti-communist. So he thought the Vietnam War was a great deal, and he knew I thought it was a terrible mistake. And he looked at me one day, and he said, because of all these fights on campus, he said, we have these terrible disagreements, but we will be friends. <laughs> I said, why? He said, because we have all the same enemies. How weird is that? <laughs> Why am I telling you this? Why am I telling you this? Because as you wander through life, if you just pay attention, you'll be amazed how many encounters like that you can have. And it will serve you well. The thing that bothers me about modern politics is that we are, we've made all this progress. We're less racist and sexist and homophobic than we used to be. We just have one remaining bigotry in America. We just don't want to be around anybody who disagrees with us. You're laughing, but it's true. I mean, but people are organizing massive living patterns in this country around being with somebody that agrees with them. If you don't believe me, read The Big Sort by Bill Bishop. In 2000, well, first in 1976, when President Carter and President Ford had a very close election, only 20% of America's counties voted for either one of them by more than 20 points. It's not 1976. 28 years later, in 2004, when now Secretary of State John Kerry and President Bush had a close election, and Bush's re-election was the narrowest margin of victory for a re-elected president since Woodrow Wilson in 1916. Nonetheless, 48% of America's counties voted for one or the other of them by more than 20%. So Americans are not hearing enough stories from other people. And it's a big mistake. If we had all the time in the world, I could keep you here till tomorrow morning telling you these stories. When I was in Oxford, I took myself all the way to Russia, even though I didn't speak Russian, couldn't even read Cyrillic script. And because I had a friend there wound up at Lumumba University, which the Russians, the Soviets had built for third world. That's what they called them then, students. 
And I was with Nigerian students in the first week of 1970 when their bloody civil war, which killed millions of people, ended. Uh, the major contesting tribes were the Igbos and the Yorubas, and there were students there from both tribes whose families were fighting each other back home. There had been no war when they came there. And over the radio, it, they announced the war ended, and I saw people crying in each other's arms whose families were back home killing each other. And it struck me that most of the things we kill each other over are not worth it. And whenever I ask myself, is this worth it, I think about those young people who were basically like put in a test tube and pushed away from their country because they could still see and hear each other. So as we go along and we talk about the politics of it, I'll tell you some more about what happened and what I learned through stories. But I hope you will remember this. The purpose of service is to help other people, not to make you feel good about yourself, although you will, not to impose everything you think should be done on other people, but to create a world where we can all live together because it's so interdependent. If we don't, the consequences to us, to our families, to our future will be adverse and severe. Every place in the world, people are trying to cooperate. They're doing pretty well. Every place in the world, people elevate our differences over our common humanity. Every place in the world where we can no longer hear what people who are different from us are saying. Where our ears are closed and our minds more closed, there is trouble. So do I think it matters what purposes there are to your politics and what policies you adopt and how you conduct politics in or out of the political arena? Oh, I think all that matters. But you have a much better chance of living both a successful and a rewarding life of service if you begin by finding something to learn from everybody you run into. If you begin by believing there is a certain inherent dignity to people who will never be on television, never be in a newspaper article, or just a statistic to most people who talk about politics. So I will close with one last story. When I was working on the tsunami with first President Bush, I, I got very attached to Aceh and Indonesia and to the Maldives and to Sri Lanka. And the UN asked me to stay on for two more years. And so I did. And one of the ways that I disappointed people is that I couldn't immediately solve the housing problem, just like it's a problem in Haiti, just like there's still people in the Katrina area who don't have homes back again. It is always the hardest thing in any natural disaster. So we were going to miss a deadline on the Aceh in Indonesia and the housing. And I said, I, I got to go there and tell them face to face. I want them to know we haven't forgotten about them and we're going to do this. So we went to the biggest camp. There were probably, uh, I don't know, by then still 10, 12, 15,000 people in this camp. Every one of these camps had an elected president. So I arrive at the camp. The president is there. His wife is there. Just a simple man who was trusted by other people to be the president of the camp. His son was there. The boy, I, I still believe, is the single most beautiful child I have ever seen in my life. This Indonesian boy, I was breathtaking, he was just luminous. And uh, so I asked my interpreter, who had been a, a very interesting young Indonesian woman who gave up her job in television, a promising career in television, just to be an interpreter to help 
until her country was put back together. We're walking down the way, and uh, after I meet the president, his wife, and son, I said, I believe that's the best looking boy I ever saw in my life. He's just gorgeous. She said, yes, he's very beautiful. And before the tsunami, he had nine brothers and sisters, and they're all gone. Now, here is what I observed. I never said a word to them about it. But pretty soon, the boy and his mother left. And this man, who had lost nine of his ten children, a man with no formal education, a man who'd never been more than a few miles away from his home in his entire life, led me through his camp. And every place, all he ever talked about was what the people there needed. He knew them. He knew their stories. And he eased his own pain by advancing their lives. It was one of the most astonishing examples of service I have ever seen. And then we get to the end of this tour. And because they knew about my foundation's work in healthcare, they saved the clinic to last. So we got to the clinic, we're talking about healthcare, and all of a sudden the president of the camp's wife shows up again with her son, but she's holding a baby. And the lady starts talking and the interpreter says, what she's telling you is that they're very grateful that you've come to the camp and listened to their concerns. And this is the newest, this is the, the most recently born baby in this camp. And we want you to name the baby because we appreciate your coming. She went on to say that in their culture, when a woman had a baby, she got to go to bed for 40 days without getting up. I thought, boy, if that gets out in America, we're all toast. <laughs> but anyway, she, so she was, the mother, did, that's why the mother didn't come herself. She was in her period of reclining. So I, I looked at the mother and I said, um, do you have a word in your language for new beginning? And I was afraid it might cause her to cry because she'd lost nine of her children. So the young woman interpreted for me and she said this, and she got this huge smile on her face. And she said, oh yes, it's lucky for you that in our language, unlike English, the word dawn, D-A-W-N, the word for dawn, is a boy's name, not a girl's name. We will name this boy Dawn, the woman said, and he will be the symbol of our new beginning. Have you ever met anybody in any position of importance with any level of wealth who could have dealt with the loss of nine of her 10 children with more dignity and honor and other orientedness the stories, if you want to serve, you have to begin with the stories. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Clinton, for uh, your stories this morning. Uh, encouraging us to listen by sharing some of those moving stories was particularly compelling to me. Um, we have a few questions from the audience here at Georgetown and also back in Little Rock at your school. So we'll start with a question from a student here at Georgetown, Gypsil Cabrian. I'm sorry if I mispronounce any of your names. Uh, if you were a professor at Georgetown, what class would you teach and why? Oh, I would like to teach a class in international uh, economics and politics because I believe that it's very important that every person in your generation have a worldview. Whether you're a conservative or a liberal or a Republican or a Democrat or independent or you come from another country and you 
that are in a different political tradition. We need a common understanding of what is the nature of the modern world. What are its biggest opportunities? What are its biggest challenges? What, are, what evidence do we have about how best we can deal with them? So I would, that's what I would teach now. Although when I was in Georgetown, I think my favorite course was um, a course in um, great ideas of the Western world, which was taught by a Palestinian professor. It was a two-hour seminar. We met once a week. And there were 14 students, 14 weeks, 14 books. Every student got a book. And every uh, seminar started off with a 10-minute presentation by the student. And if you talked more than 10 minutes, he would cut you off and say, you obviously didn't understand the book, or you could have explained it in 10 minutes. Though I love that, but if I were a professor now, that's what I would teach. All right. And the second question is from Little Rock, from your school, uh, from Andre Bro. I'm a first-year student at your school. This summer, I'll be doing my service project in Haiti. I have a two-part question. First, recognizing your support of building Haiti's textile economy, how would you defend against criticism that this approach benefits American interests more than Haitian interests? And second, will you come visit me? <laughs> well, I t what I would answer the second question is, I go once a month, so I'll doubtless be there when the student is there, and I'd be happy to see her. Or him, you didn't say what it was a man or um, <laughs> On the textile front, I, I disagree with that. Let me say, for decades, Haiti had all these textile jobs that were just cut and sew jobs. And a lot, uh, because labor was cheap. This is going to be different. This Korean company, Seya, which is a huge complex, is moving the first textile mill the country has ever had whether this company stays or goes, now they will have the capacity to produce their own clothing. They never have had it in the history of the country. And they're doing it because uh, Haiti has duty-free access to the United States and because they believe we have a chance to do it. And you can't turn down the potential of 20,000 jobs if you can get it and you think they're going to make a living wage in an environmentally safe way. So... I don't think that this aids the American economy any more than any other clothing imports do, and it's a big difference for Haiti because now they'll have a, the potential to develop their own indigenous clothing operation because this will be their first textile mill. The third question comes from a Georgetown student, uh, Amy Tennant. Which public policy... Which public policy instituted during your tenure are you most proud of? That's hard to answer. I love AmeriCorps, the National Service Program, and I think it should be bigger, and I think more people should have the chance to do it. But I think that, I think that before the recession, welfare reform did way more good than harm, even though there were some things in it that the Republican Congress insisted on I thought were not good. Though the problem with the, the welfare reform law was we capped payments to states at what they were making in February, getting in February of 94 when the welfare rolls were at an all-time high. When they dropped 60% when I was president, states had a lot of money, which they were supposed to put into education and training and other things. What happened is after I left office, a lot of them were permitted to stop spending that money on poor people, which I think was a terrible mistake. But I'm still very proud that we did it. But I'm most proud, I think, of the economic policy that we began with the passage by one vote in both houses of my economic plan in 93, because that drove down interest rates, drove up investment, accelerated new jobs, particularly in technology, and most important of all to me, we had like 30% more jobs in my eight years, 40% more than in President Reagan's term. 
but we had a hundred times as many people move from poverty to the middle class. It's the only period of shared prosperity we've had in the last 35 years. And I was very proud of that. And it still means a lot to me because I still have people come up to me and tell me that they work their way from welfare into a good, solid job, and they raise their children to have a better life. And that's still the most important thing to me. It's gotten surprisingly little notice and surprisingly little academic analysis. How come the economic path we chose and the economic path chosen by my predecessors in the both Bush administrations, they had recession, so poverty increased. So I, I don't count that. Just, just Reagan's years plus mine, we had 100 times as many people move from poverty into the middle class. That's what I'm really proud of. We gave people a chance to make their own stories. So if you were, so if you were to become an international economics professor at Georgetown, would that be your path of research? <laughs> If I were what? If you were to become the international economics professor, professor at Georgetown, would that be your path of research contribution to academ academia? No. <laughs> but, no, because I know the story and because it wouldn't be as trusted. I'd rather have somebody else do it and figure out why than have somebody else do it and disagree with them and, you know, do it. I, I shouldn't be. It'd be too self-serving for me to do it. No, I, if I were... Here in my research, I would be focused on what we could do to increase the level of employment growth around the world because one of the real problems with having IT-driven growth, and believe me, I think it's been a godsend. We used, when we rebuilt the fisher fishing industry in Indonesia and Sri Lanka and we put all these men and women back in fishing boats, we gave them cell phones for the first time and their incomes averaged a 30% increase because they could find out what the real price of fish was every day, and no one could lie to them anymore. I could give you, we, we, we started rebuilding Haiti, and 90% of the people were unbanked. And the banks didn't want to fool with them because they could make all the money they needed because 19% of Haiti's income every year is from remittances from the United States and Canada and Bermuda and Dominican Republic and France. And so the banks can just charge a fee to convert those currencies into gourds, and they don't want to have to worry about serving poor folks, making loans to little businesses. So, I, you know, I would like to talk about things like that, how we started a small business loan program there and how we started a home mortgage program there. We need the best minds we can to think about how we are going to create more jobs, because what I was going to say is, in spite of all these joys of IT, they do make everybody so much more productive that every year, not just in manufacturing, but in other things, you can do more with fewer people. So how are we going to find sustainable employment in both poor countries, rich countries, and in the rising countries? How are we going to do this? And how are we going to make the adjustments for different cultures and different possibilities and different levels of natural resources. I think there's way too little research on that. And we all, when I got elected president, I had been governor of a state which never had an unemployment rate below the national average until I ran for president, ironically. And that year, we were first or second in job growth every month. But we worked 10 years to rejigger the economy. And the American people need some sense of how we're going to do this, and so do people throughout the world. We just, we're still, we don't have a, I, I think, a, we don't know enough to know how these new realities are different from what we did in the 90s, but I'm quite sure that if I did everything we did then, it wouldn't produce the jobs we need. And I have some ideas, but I think we should do more on it. The, another question from a student here at Georgetown is from Salvador Rosas. During your time as president in 1996, you passed the Immigration Reform Act. What do you believe it will take for us to pass a comprehensive immigration reform that would help solve current problems with our immigration system? Well, you have only two obstacles, really. Uh, will there be a filibuster in the Senate? 
And will the Speaker of the House allow the, uh, any bill that passes the Senate to be voted on the House floor if a majority of the Republicans are not for it? That had been their policy more or less since Newt Gingrich was Speaker, and it was formalized under Dennis Hastert. But John Boehner deserves a lot of credit. He varied from that policy three times this year already, including to allow the House to vote on the Violence Against Women Act, which did pass by a big bipartisan majority, but not by a majority within the Republican caucus. So I think, you know, they're going to pass this immigration reform, I think, and I'll be surprised if it doesn't get 70 votes in the Senate. Because just the pure demographics of it, it's uh, the Republicans, I think, know they can't be a national party if they lose 72, 75 percent of the Latino vote. And, you know, three or four more times, the numbers are only going to get bigger. And so, uh, and I think the same thing is true of Asians. And when, when the, we had a huge influx of Asian immigrants, a lot of the Vietnamese were militantly anti-communist and came here and were inclined to vote Republican because they perceived that the Republicans were more anti-communist than the Democrats and that the Democrats had driven the country's disengagement from Vietnam, even though President Ford was in office when the last troops were withdrawn. And all of that's changed over all this immigration business so that now we have the Democrats tend to get a big majority of the Asian vote, too, and they're growing like crazy. So I think just for sheer demographic reasons, we're going to get it. Also, keep in mind, there are economic imperatives here. The United States, one of the things that gives me hope about our economy is that we are younger than Europe. We are younger than Japan. We are not resistant to immigrants, historically. Only Ireland is younger than we are. Thanks to the Catholics, they've still got a high birth rate. <laughs> and, and by the way, and, and, now that you're laughing, and you should know that the Irish were very open to immigration. There was a huge variety of immigrants in Ireland in their boom years, and a lot of those folks went home, mostly to Central Europe. Uh, but they'll come back again if things pick up again. So this is an economic imperative for us. I do believe it'll pass. I think it is possible, depending on the details of the path to citizenship, I think it's possible that there won't be a majority of the Republican House caucus for it. And then the, they'll have to decide whether to let it come to the floor or not. But I really think this will pass. The next question is also from a Georgetown student, uh, Jessica Albert from Parker, Colorado. Uh, what was your motivation for starting the Clinton Foundation, and what distinguishes it in your mind from other humanitarian initiatives? Well, I started the foundation with a kind of a it wasn't a vague notion. I had a very clear notion, but I didn't have the details filled in. I knew when I left office, I did not want to spend most of my time just talking about current political issues or talking about my record or legacy. I wanted to spend time on issues I had cared a lot about as president where I could still have an impact. Now, there are a lot of things I care about as president, but I have relatively small impact, like will there be peace between the Palestinians and Israelis? I have spent a fair amount of time in the Middle East since I left office. I still keep up contacts there. I do what I can. But that is more the province of governments as facilitators in the case of the United States but also what the leaders of those countries and the people of those countries want to do. So it would be foolish, I think, for me to just be one more of the voices saying that, believe me, they, uh, they all know what I think about it, but it doesn't matter. I don't have the position anymore to have as much impact. 
but in all these other things I do. So what I did was I started out um, with that in mind, and then in, I began working with Nelson Mandela and AIDS when there was no global fund on AIDS, TB, and malaria. There was no PEPFAR program. The United States, when I left office, was spent providing about, I think, 28% of all the money the world was spending to fight AIDS, and it was a pittance. And so we were trying to raise more money. And from there, I got into being asked to deal with the systematic challenges faced in the Caribbean, which then had the second fastest growth rate of AIDS in the world after Africa. And everything else just kind of fell into place after that. Then a few years later, I got interested in whether one of my staff members uh, suggested to me we ought to have a meeting like the Davos meeting at the opening of the UN because people could come and meet with the people who'd come from the UN and leaders in business and all. And I said, who would pay to come to New York during the UN? when it already has the worst traffic in the world. I said, I got a bright idea. We'll make it even harder for them. We'll say, if you come to our meeting, you have to promise to do something to help somebody somewhere, and you got to keep the promise if you want to come back. It was the first meeting of its kind ever where we asked people to meet with different people and make commitments. And it's worked out pretty well, but it was a wild leap. And that's sort of, we, these things have come up, that, and then I deliberately took up the cause of childhood obesity because I think it's a worth public health problem in the country. So I tried to chart these programs within the framework of my record and my passions as president where I could still have an impact and to have the discipline to try to stop doing things when I thought it could have an impact and it turned out not to work so that we just keep, you know, trying to measure for impact and do that. And the final question is from another student at your school in Little Rock, and it ties very nicely back to the theme of, of your talk today. Uh, Nate Kennedy asks, I've heard you say that, and we heard you again today also say this, that the last remaining widespread, widespread bigotry is toward those with whom we have ideological differences. What can we do to bring people together? Well, it's very interesting. If you, I'll never forget, I've, I had a very interesting encounter when I was attempting to change the Pentagon policy on gays in the military 20 years ago. And everybody knows we failed. But the, most people don't know what really happened or what was designed to do, but that's not important now. There was a survey which came out on this issue. And it said that... Uh, in the population of the United States as it existed in 1993, which is very different from now, when we're much more diverse now in every way than we were then, the public was about evenly divided. And I had pushed it to where, in this survey, it was 48 to 45 for my position on allowing people to serve without regard to sexual orientation. But it was a political loser because of the 45 who disagreed with me, 33% of them were intensely opposed, and only 16% of the people who were for me were intensely for it. So the real political vote was 33 against 16 for. And that's the problem that our, my friends who are trying to pass this gun legislation are having. I don't agree with them anymore, but before when... I passed an assault weapons ban that had a 10-bullet ammunition limit. And it did just fine. And it was a sick day for me when it was allowed to expire in 1994. But what happened in the congressional elections of 94 was that the people who were for what I did, a majority, said, thank you very much. I think I'll vote on something else. The people who were against it said, I'm going to kill you. I wouldn't vote for you if you were the last candidate on earth. So that the fact that we had majority support didn't amount to anything. It's always the intensity of support that you have to measure. 
So that's like when people say, gosh, there's 90% support for this. How could they vote against it? Because they all believe that the opposition is more heated. And we need to prove, we, I think they're wrong this time, by the way. I think, you know, this is, you know, the old story about a, the problem with a cat that sits on a hot stove is that that cat will never sit on a hot stove again, but also it will never sit on a coal stove. I think this is a coal stove and we could do this, this background check business, but that's what the problem is anyway. Um, I didn't answer, what was it? But in terms of... I didn't answer your question. So in terms, in how, how then do you engage that intensity of opposition? I was there when he showed his first signs of dementia. What? <laughs> How do you then engage that intensity right, of well, here's opposition? Here's what I think you have to do. First of all, you got to realize, for the legitimate differences, let's say over gun control, it's basically it's an urban-rural deal. I mean, there are a lot of, you can't, there are some people you can't reach. But if you live in a city, you're way better off, and you think you need protection in your home, you're way better off with a shotgun than an assault weapon. Trust me, you'd, it's not even close. So this is mostly a rural-urban deal. You know, remember Senator Murkowski talking about how in the far reaches of Alaska, if somebody wants to sell a gun to their next-door neighbor, how can you possibly ask for a background check? And the, the Congress, keep in mind, the Constitution set Congress up this way so that rural states have disproportionate influence in the United States Senate because every state gets two senators. So I just think they need to keep talking about it. I think they can do that. And I think the president having these two dinners with the Republican senators is a good thing. I think the president meeting with the women senators was a good thing. I think, you know, I read the other day an article saying in the first uh, one of these dinners, it would seem too stilted because everybody had something they wanted to say to him, and so it took the whole two hours they had set aside for the dinner. But I spent, after the endless hours just listening to people and you know just finally just like just digging and digging and digging it doesn't always work I mean one of the reasons we're in the mess we're in in the Middle East today is that I spent eight years listening and I proposed a peace proposal and Israel said yes and Arafat wouldn't say yes or no and even though he told me he was going to and it was the most colossal political error of my lifetime. And a lot has flowed out of this. One of the reasons that we're still stuck is that the, Mr. Abbas, for whom I have a lot of respect, said he wanted a settlement freeze. So Hillary and other people went out and got a settlement freeze for 10 months, which is a big deal out of Netanyahu's government since his whole base of support was the West Bank settlers. And they wouldn't talk to him. They waited until the 10 months was over, and then he said, now, give me another 10-month freeze, and maybe I will talk to him. Bad move. And so you just, you know, it doesn't always work. Or second thing I want to tell you, if you get into politics, nothing lasts forever. It's a human creation. So people come to me all the time and say, weren't you sick that President Bush reversed your economic policies and we went from surpluses as far as the eye could see to doubling the debt? And I said, yeah, that made me sick, but the American people made it possible. So if you, you know, one of the, I'm constantly amazed when people vote and then they're surprised that people they vote for do what they promise to do. It wasn't like he made a secret of what he was going to do. That's the other thing I want to tell you. Most politicians actually do try to do what they say they're going to do, which should be the basis for this kind of communication. You know, I, But I, I just don't know how much these people are talking. It, it may not be possible, but I just know this. Look what's, where America has come back. San Diego, the Human Genome Center of America. Orlando, the Computer Simulation Center of America. 
even in Cleveland with all its trouble, the Cleveland Clinic and the community college are training the hardest unemployed population we have, middle-aged, non-college educated people, to do jobs that will grow in the healthcare industry, whatever happens and however the healthcare bills implemented. You just look around the country. The places which are doing well are places where there's creative cooperation. One of the problems these people have in Washington today is that the congressional districts are drawn so that the most liberal and the most conservative of our members in Congress had to worry far more about being pure and being defeated by a primary challenge than losing a general election because they did not work with people from the other side to get things done. So that the political reality in a lot of these House districts is very different than the national political reality and the, than the screaming hunger of the American people to see people make honorable compromises and get the show on the road. But I, my advice is, you can't get tired of listening. You just have to keep coming at people. You have to figure out where they're coming from, what their motives are, what their interests are. When I was, all these peace deals I tried to work out, I never argued so much about what I thought was right or wrong as I did about why I thought it was in their interest to take it. And you just have to, there's no easy answer here. But disengagement is a recipe for failure. So my view is you just got to get it. You just can't get tired of just reaching out and bullying ahead with it. Wonderful. Two final words. First, uh, audience here in Gaston, please stay here until President Clinton has departed. And finally, help me in thanking President Clinton for joining us today. Thank you.